Good morning and happy new year. Would you please stand as we honor our God. Come, people of the risen King, sing to him this day.
again, oh Father. Oh Father, use my hands of love in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only hope is you.
Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this uh, very first Sunday of the new year. Uh, whether you're worshiping with us here at the Buford campus or at one of our branch campuses the, in Graniteville and in Bluffton. And next week we're going to be opening up a campus in Grays that will be serving the Hampton and Jasper County areas. So we're looking forward to that. Yes, absolutely. And of course, uh, around the world on the internet, welcome to you one and all. If you're visiting with us for the first time, I'd like to direct your attention to the seat back pocket in front of you where you'll find one of these connect cards. If you'll fill that out at the end of the service, drop it in the offering, then we'll be uh, sending you some information about us. Now, why not find someone near you and wish them a very happy new year, CBC style. Gather back and remain standing if you would and sing, come, behold the wondrous mystery. Come, behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises wrote in frail humanity. In our Took on flesh to 
Christ in power, resurrected as we will be when he comes. Life everlasting for all who believe that we need a Savior. Jesus is the one. Prepare our hearts, O oh God. Help us to Show us Christ, Lord. 
I think that would be a great prayer to begin the new year with. So as you join me, let's pray together this morning. Our Father and our God, on this first Sunday of the new year, we would ask you to show us Christ. You are the God of the universe. You alone have the words of life that we need. So, Father, show us Christ. Lord, this passage of Scripture is an important passage if we are to have the lives that you desire for us in the coming year. And so I would ask you to come and speak through your word to us today because unless you come, nothing will happen. So come, remind us of your word, please. And in Christ's name, amen. I have a cracker from the Lord's table stuck in my throat. <clears throat> I found out you're supposed to chew those things before you speak. <clears throat> and it will not go down. So, forgive me if I keep taking drinks of water and coughing. I apologize this morning. I've had water. I've had coffee. <clears throat> Chuck Beach wanted to do the Heimlich thing on me. <clears throat> God teaches us lessons, doesn't he? Even through crackers. <clears throat> it's the first Sunday of the new year. So you know we're going to do a message, a sermon on how to have a great year. I was thinking about that recently. And I thought, what is the key to having a great year in 2019? That is, living the life that God desires us to live. <clears throat> and enjoying all the blessings that He has for us in this coming year and being used by Him. What's the key? If I were to ask you what do you think the key is to have a great year, some of you might say, well, it's New Year's resolutions. And if you said that, you would not be alone. The Babylonians practiced making New Year's resolutions, as did the Egyptians, and even the kings in medieval times were known to make New Year's resolutions. And, and vast majority of our peop the people in our country would do that. What's interesting is studies show that by January the 30th, people have broken at least 50% of their New Year's resolutions. It's January the 6th. I think probably most of us have already broken our New Year's resolutions for the coming year. So nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions. But I don't think that's the key to having a great year. We say if it's not New Year's resolutions, then maybe the key to the coming year is to do some self-help programs or self-help books. You know, I mean, they're... If you go to a bookstore, you'll find a whole section dealing with how to improve your speaking or how to improve your teaching or how to be a better listener or how to improve your marriage, how to be a better husband, a better wife, a better worker, a better boss, a better this or better that or all kinds of things. Nothing wrong with those. But I don't think that's the key to having a great year. And somebody else will say, well, the key to having a great year then has got to be that we make more commitments in our lives. You know, in our spiritual lives, in our lives, more commitments to, a greater commitment to attend church or to serve or to do this or to do that or all kinds of things. And those things are needed, certainly. But I don't think that's the key to having a great year. You say, well, what is the key? What if I told you I think the key to having a great year is to remember? Remember what? Let's find out in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Would you turn there with me? Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you go to the book of Genesis and just go to the right a few books, you'll find the book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and the book of Deuteronomy is God has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They had been in bondage and slavery for hundreds of years in Egypt, cried out to God. He's brought them out of that, that bondage, out of slavery. He's about to have them enter the promised land. And before he has them enter the promised land in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, God, through Moses, gives some final words to the people of Israel. And in chapter 8, he says, before you enter the promised land, then I want you to remember. And notice on your outline, there are three things he wanted them to remember. First of all, they were to remember their past. They were to remember their past. Join me in verses 2 through 6, would you? It says in verse 2, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. That he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. 
He humbled you and he let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Moses says to the people of Israel, before you enter the promised land, remember your past. And it's the same word that God would have for you and I today. Before we enter 2019, we've already started it, but before we go any farther, remember your past. Now those are unusual words for us as believers in Christ because usually in Christianity, what we say to people is look ahead. Look ahead to the coming of Christ. Look ahead to the rapture and we'll rise to meet Jesus Christ in the air. You know, in, in the midst of this world, you need encouragement, so look ahead. And we ought to look ahead. But I would tell you there are times in our lives when we ought to look backwards and remember our past. Now, when we say remember the past, we're not saying live in the past. Some people focus so much upon the hurts and the pains and what happened to them in the past that they allow that to keep them from living for God in the present. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about living in the past. Just remember it. So what does it mean to remember the past? I think the key is found in the word remember. That word remember is found 13 times in the book of Deuteronomy. And whenever you find an author in the scriptures using the same word over and over again, <clears throat> then you know that that word is important to them. And it is important here. So what are we to remember as believers in Jesus Christ? What were the Israelites to remember? Notice on your outline, first of all, the word remember means to reflect. It means to reflect. It speaks of a mental exercise, if you will. The word remember in the Hebrew speaks of a mental exercise of reviewing or reflecting upon the past. And we would expect that to be the case. Now what's interesting about that is as Moses is speaking here, the people of Israel, they are on the edge of the promised land. They've waited for years to enter the promised land. That's what they wanted most in life. They can't, they're biting at the bit to get into the promised land. And Moses says, before you enter, stop and reflect upon your past. What was it they were to reflect upon? The same things that you and I are to reflect upon today in our past. It's not in your outline, but first of all, they were to reflect upon how God led them. Look at verse 2. It says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. And God had led them for 40 years. Brought them out of that slavery in Egypt. And then he led them for 40 years in the wilderness. Now God could have very quickly taken them right from the land of Egypt into the promised land. Somebody has estimated it would have taken them about 11 days to go from Egypt into the promised land. But if you look at a map of the wanderings of the people of Israel in the wilderness, you'll find they're here, they're there. They're all over the place. And it lasted for 40 years, mainly because of their sin of unbelief, but partially because they, they were not ready to enter the promised land. And so God has them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, if you and I could go back and talk to one of the Israelites, if we were to ask them about God's leading back then in the wilderness, and say, what was that like? They'd probably say, you know, that was very confusing. We, we, we couldn't understand what God was doing at times. Why didn't he just take us directly into the promised land? But then they would say, but as we reflect back over it, you know what, we find that God's leading was best. We were not ready for that. And God knows what is best. I wonder, as you look back over 2018, did God's leading at times in your life seem confusing? Or as you look back over your life, has God's leading in your life been confused? Have you ever had times in your life when you can't figure out what God's doing, but then in the end you look back and you say, I didn't understand it, but God knew what was best. Or have you ever looked back over your life and traced the hand of God in your life and watched how he moved in your life to get you to where you are today? I did that just recently. I think about that just recently, and I thought, you know, it's amazing what God did in my life to get me where I'm at today. And I, I make it, God's leading is kind of like a cross-stitching. You know, the ladies, they have that cross-stitching, and you look on the other side, you get all these strings coming down, and it looks like a mess, but you turn it over, and it's beautiful. And I think that's how God's leading is often in our lives. We see just the bottom. We see the individual times of God's leading, and it don't make sense together. But you look at overall, you look back at your life, and you say, man, it's amazing how God has led me in my life. Have you ever looked back over your life? 
You look back over 2018, how God led you. What did you learn? Did you learn that when your life seems confusing, that God has a perfect plan for your life? Did you learn back in 2018 that when you couldn't make sense of what was happening in your life, that you could trust the hand of God? What did you learn about God's leading in 2018? Moses would say, stop and reflect upon it. But it wasn't just the leading of God in their lives that God wanted, Moses wanted them to remember. He also wanted them to remember the times of God's testing in their lives. Look at verse 2 again. He says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he <clears throat> might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. And there were times when God tested the people of Israel. Now the word testing is an interesting Hebrew word in that it can go two ways. On the one hand, it is a word in the Hebrew language that means to prove or to show what's there. And there were times as the people of Israel were wandering through the wilderness that God would bring some difficulty or some situation in their life where they felt like they were stretched to the limit and felt almost like they could not make it. And God was testing them as to whether they would believe him and trust him. But the word testing also has a word, it has a meaning to it that means to build up. So as God was taking them to those, to those difficult times, he was not just trying to prove what was there, but he was also building into their lives. And very possibly in your life and mine, in 2018, God took you through some times of testing. Some times when you felt like you were stretched to the limit and you didn't know if you could make it. Or if not in 2018, then you probably have had those in your lives. What did you learn during those times? You learned, did you learn that when you feel like you're stretched to the limit, that by the grace of God you can go a little bit farther? Did you learn that no matter what happens in your life, that God will get you through it. What did you learn in 2018 during your times of testing? Moses would say, stop and reflect upon it. But there was a third thing Moses wanted them to reflect upon and stop and reflect upon. He wanted them to reflect upon what I call the blessings of God in verses 3 and 4. And in verses 3 and 4, Moses mentions some of the blessings of God. He mentions, first of all, the manna in verse 3. He says, God fed you with manna which you did not know. The people cried out to God because they were hungry and could not find food, and so God gave them manna. It was a wafer-like material, and every morning God would just have it laying on the ground, and all they had to do was go out and pick it up. Imagine the husband wakes up and says, I'm hungry, and the wife says, just a minute, and goes out and gets him some manna. How would you like that, ladies? No more grocery shopping, no more making recipes, no more going through planning and what you're going to, fa what you're going to eat. It's just manna, manna, manna. And God blessed them with manna. But it wasn't just manna that he gave him. Verse 4 says that your clothing did not wear out on you. Imagine that. For 40 years they wore the same clothes and it never wore out. Somebody comes up to you and you said, man, is that a new outfit? No, it's 40 years old. <laughs> Looks new. Never wore out. Never had to mend it. Never went out of style. Everybody wore the same thing, by the way. And Moses says, remember how God... Gave you clothing that never wore out. But then he also says there in verse 4 at the end, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. In other words, your shoes and your sandals didn't wear out. They did not hurt your feet. Imagine that for 40 years, never having to have a new pair of shoes or sandals. I, I must walk. I walk a, a weird way, and so I wear out the side of my shoes. Never mind, you don't need to know that. Imagine what it had to be like. The shoes never wore out. Sandals never wore out. What was Moses doing? He was reminding them of all of God's blessing and goodness to them. And saying, stop and reflect upon it and how, God, how good God has been to you and learn from it. And I wonder today, have you taken time to reflect back on 2018 and reflect on how good God has been to you? What did you learn? Did you learn that God will always be faithful to supply your needs? And did you learn that God will always take care of you? And most of us say, Stop and reflect upon God's goodness and learn from it. And then there was one final area there that God, Moses wanted the people to learn or reflect upon. In verse 5, and that was the times of discipline. Verse 5, he says, Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. The word discipline means correction. And there were times in the wanderings in the wilderness when the people would go after other gods or disobey God or not have faith in God, and God would have to discipline them. He'd have to correct them. He'd have to bring some difficulty into their lives to turn them around. Did you experience God's discipline in your life in 2018? 
Or have you ever experienced God's discipline in your life? What'd you learn? You say, Pastor Larry, where are you getting at? Where are you getting at with all of this? The Israelites here had four types of experiences in the wilderness. They had times of God's leading, times of God's testing, times of God's blessing, and times of God's discipline. And Moses wanted them not just to go through those experiences, but to stop, to reflect on them, and to learn from them. And I would tell you this morning that that's the same thing that God wants to do for you and for me. He wants us to stop. We've had the same four types of experiences in our lives. And God doesn't want us just to go through 2018 and forget about it. God wants us to stop and reflect upon it and to learn from it. What did you learn last year? What was God seeking to teach you in 2018? And most of us say, stop and reflect upon it. Secondly, the word remember does not just mean to reflect. It means to celebrate. You still with me? Good. The word remember means to celebrate. It's an interesting Hebrew word, that word remember. You reflect upon it, but then you also celebrate. You celebrate, you, you give thanks for it. Now, I'm sure if we could somehow interview one of those Israelites again, and we would say, are you grateful for how God worked in your life in those 40 years of wandering, those times of blessing and those times of testing and, and those times of leading you in discipline? Are you grateful for those? I, I think if we could somehow talk to one of the Israelites, they would say, you know what, the blessings, yes. But those times of discipline and testing and those times of difficulty, you know what? No, I'm not great. Those shouldn't be in our lives. They should not have been there. And if you and I were honest this morning, we would probably have the same mindset. We would say times of blessing, yes, God, bring them on, but difficulty and all those other things, no, they shouldn't be in our lives. When our little granddaughter Riley, when she was just a little thing, our son and daughter-in-law taught Riley, when she couldn't speak, to do the baby sign language, whatever it is. I, I, this meant something, and this meant something, and I don't know all of them. I used to watch her do them, and then Riley came to stay with us for a period of time. We took her out to the beach, and she loved to walk and find little shells, and she'd pick them up. She'd get so excited about a little shell. And I remember picking one up, and then all of a sudden she'd look up. Here was a whole pile of shells. And that little girl got so excited, she started doing all the signs. I thought I was back in baseball. I didn't know she was telling me to slide or to bunt. But, and we do that with God. We say, blessings. Yes, God, bring them on. Bring more of them. But times of difficulty and times of discipline and times of pain and heartache in our life, no, those shouldn't be there. And yet I would tell you the opposite this morning, friends. I would tell you that those are some of the most valuable times of our lives. Those times of difficulty and testing and discipline are mentors from God, just like blessings. They're mentors from God, meant to teach us what God wants us to learn, meant to build into our lives. They are not wasted times. They are valuable times in our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor back in 1943, was in prison because of Jesus Christ. He wrote this about his time in prison. He said, as much as I long to be out of here, I believe a single day has not been wasted. Something good is bound to come out of it. We should come out of it all the more strengthened. And I would agree with him, friends. He saw those times in prison as, as not wasted times, but times when God was building into him and using him. And I would tell you the same is true for you and me. In fact, I would tell you that until we see the times of testing and discipline and difficulty in our lives as being mentors from God and valuable and we give thanks for them, to God for them, we will never learn the lessons that God has for us. Because listen, without those times, you and I would never be the people that God wants us to be. Without those times of blessing, yes, but times of difficulty and testing and pain and heartache, we would never be the people God wants us to be without them. I've had people over the years say to me, wouldn't you love to go back and relive your life and change it? And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change those times of blessing in my life nor those times of difficulty. I, I wouldn't change those times when it felt like times of victory or times of defeat in my life. 
I want to change those times when I felt like as a believer I could walk on water for Jesus Christ and those times when I was rock bottom. I want to change those times when God seemed to be answering every prayer of mine and nor would I change those times when my dreams and heartaches were broken. I, I, I wouldn't change any of that because I would not be the person I am today if it were not for those times. I, I wouldn't change a thing. You know, it's one year ago today, on this Sunday, that I told you I had cancer. It's amazing a year has gone by. I'd gone through five months of treatments of shots and some other things. And I was about to start the next day five weeks of daily radiation for that cancer. And I've had people say to me, I'll, I'll bet you wish that never happened in your life. No. I'm grateful for it. So I've learned some lessons in the past year from God and going through cancer. In fact, I learned three lessons. I learned, number one, that when God leads you down a path that you had not expected or you do not like or you do not want, that you can trust Him. I've learned His plan is best. I learned, number two, in the past year that when I'm weak, I'm strong, like Paul says. Remember that when Paul said that? When he was weak, he was strong. And I learned through the cancer and the treatments when it just drained my body of energy that when I needed life to be able to preach or to teach or to do what I needed to do, I had, did not have that, and God somehow would get me through every time. And I've learned that when I'm weak, I'm strong because of Jesus Christ. And I've learned that no matter what path God leads me down, wherever he leads, he opened doors of opportunity because through those cancer treatments and those daily radiation treatments, I was able to share with two people about Jesus Christ, two of the people giving me treatments. I was able to share with some people that were there for their cancer treatments about Christ and to encourage others who were already believers. You know what? I never would have had those opportunities if it wasn't for that cancer. Now, I don't want to go through it again. But I'm grateful for it. I wonder today, have you taken time to reflect upon 2018 and the lessons God sought to teach you and have you given thanks for them? But there's another part to this word, remember. It means to reflect, it means to celebrate, and thirdly, it means to act upon. It means to act upon. So Moses is saying to him, don't just reflect upon the lessons that God has taught you. Don't just give thanks for them, but act upon them. In other words, let them change your life. Do something about it. Why would he say that? Because we are people of habit. We are creatures of habit, aren't we? A few years back, I preached on that, and I said, you're sitting in the same chair that you always sit in. Remember that sermon? Guess what you're sitting in today? Same chair. You haven't moved one bit. Why? Because you're creatures of habit. I said two, two years ago, three years ago, I said, you know, if the rapture happens, the only thing we're going to miss is our chairs. <laughs> we sit in the same seats. We eat the same food. We do the same things. And the Israelites did that. They were no different than us. They were creatures of habit. In the wilderness, you know what they did? They went after other gods, and, and they disobeyed God. They didn't have faith in God. Guess what they did in the promised land? They went after other gods, and they disobeyed God, and they did not have faith in God. They were creatures of habit, just like us. And we are the same way. It's not just with food and where we sit. We're creatures of habit in life. And you and I are struggling with the same issues today that we struggled with 5, 10, 15 years ago. In fact, the issues that you and I are coming are faced with on January 6, 2019 are the same issues that you and I were faced with on January 6, 2018. The very same issues. They may come out in different ways, but we are struggling with the same things. And you say, well, okay, Pastor Larry, but why bring all that up? Because I think this is a time to change. See, I think what Moses was doing here in, Rome, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 is that Mo Rome... Moses wanted them to change. He knew they had a great life before them in the promised land. But he knew they could not enjoy that life unless they changed, unless they were changed and dealt with the issues of their lives. And I would tell you the same is true with you and with me. 
This is a Sunday God wants us to change. He's got a great plan for your life and mine in 2019. Doesn't mean there's not going to be cancer. Doesn't mean there's not going to be difficulty and problems. But it's a great life. But he says, if you're going to enjoy that great life in the coming year, then you've got to stop and change. You say, well, how do I do that? I think you stop and ask three questions. Write these down somewhere on your outline or somebody else's outline. Write them down. It's the same three questions I think God wanted the Israelites to stop and answer. Question number one, where are you at? Where are you at with God? Where are you at in life? Where are you at with your finances? Where are you at with your job, your church, everything? Where are you at today? Question number two, what did God seek to teach you in 2018? And question number three, what does God want to change in your life in 2019? Three simple questions, but important questions. In fact, what I would encourage you to do is sit down by yourself today or this week and answer those three questions. Or if you're married, sit down with your husband, your wife, or with your family and sit down and ask those three questions and pray about them. Where are we at right now in life with God and with our finances, with everything else? What did God teach us in 2018? And what does he want to change? But don't just discuss them, but write them out. You say, why write them out? Because when you write out what you find, studies show that people who write them out tend to change more upon them. They do something about it. In fact, right before Christmas, I, I went to Hobby Lobby and bought a journal. 40% off coupon online. <laughs> I did. It's even got a Bible verse on the front from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ. It must be special. And I bought it for this very reason. To examine my life in 2018, to look back and to write in, what did I learn and what is God, what is he seeking to teach me and where am I at and what does he want to change? Listen, you don't need a journal from Hobby Lobby. Sit down and write it out. And then pray and say, God, change me. See, there's a trap for us every year. Every one of us falls into the same trap every year. Every January, we fall in the same trap. That trap is this, just like the Israelites. We either pretend that we have no issues in our lives, like, oh, there's nothing in my life, no struggles, no issues, God wants to change. Or we just accept those issues as being part of our lives and we never change. And so we go year after year after year after year of never being changed. When what God wants to do is to change our lives. The sad thing here for the Israelites is that the promised land offered so much to the Israelites. It offered them such a great life. But sadly, they were never able to fully enjoy it because they never changed to be the people God desired them to be. Does anybody know where 2018 went? Our son Larry, our oldest son, his name's Larry as well. His birthday was in November and he said to me, Dad, I'm 40 years old. He said, where has life gone? I said, how do you think I feel? <laughs> You're 40, I'm 65. Where has life gone? And you know what's going to happen in 2019? 2019 is going to come to the end. And if you and I are not careful, then we're going to come to the end of 2019 and have the same areas that God wants to work on as we have today. And we will need to learn the same lessons all over again. I wonder if you join with me later in the service just asking God to change us. And say, God, make 2019 a year of change for me. Would you do that with me? I'll take that as a yes. So first of all, Moses says, remember your past. Secondly, on your outline, he says, remember your dangers. Remember your dangers. Look with me, beginning in verse 7, would you? A lot of verses, and I don't want us to get lost in these, but I want us to understand these. He says, for the Lord your God has bring you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing forth in valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. A land where you eat food without scarcity in which you will not lack anything. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. 
And when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and you've built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty grounds where there was no water. He brought you water for you. He brought water for you out of the rock of Flint, and in the wilderness he fed you manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, "My power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth." But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who has given you power to make wealth, that He may confirm His covenant which He swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Wow. There's dangers in there, friends. Did you know there are dangers in your life in 2019? The same dangers that the Israelites had back at this time as they were about to enter the promised land. Now let me say up front, they had two types of dangers. This is not on your outline. They had an outer danger. That was the people of the promised land. The Hittites, the Amalekites, and the other ites of people that were there. And that was a very real danger. And they were going to seek to kill the Israelites. But as great as that danger was, that wasn't the greatest danger they faced. Their greatest danger was on the outside, it was on the inside. Them, themselves, and what was in their heart. And I would tell you this morning that we have dangers on the outside in 2019. Living for Christ in this world, you're living in a world that is against Jesus Christ. You're going to face pressure, you're going to face persecution, you're going to face difficulty because of your faith in Christ. But I would tell you, just like the Israelites, that's not the greatest danger. The greatest danger we face this, this year is not going to be the outer world. It's not going to be Satan. It's going to be what's inside of you and me. So what dangers would that be? Well, Moses is going to tell us what those dangers are here in just a moment. But before he tells us what the dangers are, he first seeks to describe the promised land so we can understand what it was like. And he notes verse 7, he says it's a good land. Verse 7, he says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. The word good there is a Hebrew word that means it's better. It's better. Better than what? It's better than the wilderness. How is it the promised land better than wilderness? We need to understand this because if we're going to understand the dangers, we have to understand how the promised land was better than the wilderness. It was better in three ways. Number one, there was better water in the promised land. That's not in your outline. There is better water there. Look at verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing forth in valleys and hills. Brooks and fountains and springs. In other words, there's going to be water everywhere in the promised land. All you could want. Now, may, that may not seem like much to us. It may not seem like a big deal to us because we live in a low country. We're surrounded by water. But to the Israelites, that was a big deal. Because there were times as they wandered through the wilderness that they could not find water. And so they would complain to God, complain to Moses and say, why have you brought us out here to die of thirst? See, you have to have water to, to survive. Some of us here think this morning you have to have sweet tea to survive. But you have to have water to survive. And Moses says, you know what? When you get into the promised land, you're going to have all the water you could want. Secondly, the promised land offered better food. Notice this, verses 8 and 9. It says, It's a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything. Verse 8, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Man, there's going to be a great variety of food when you get to the promised land. In fact, he says, verse 9, is going to be without scarcity. It's all you can want. The word scarcity means without lack. You can have everything you want there of food. And once again, that may not seem like a big deal to us. Because all we have to do is open our refrigerator, our cupboard, we got all the food we could want. But to the Israelites wandering through the wilderness, there were times when they could not find food. And when God finally gave them manna, you know what? They got tired of it. Because think about it. What did they have for breakfast? Manna. What did they have for lunch? What did they have for supper? Yeah, and you had, they had fried manna, boiled manna, barbecued manna, casserole manna, 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 manna. And they grew tired of it. They didn't have casserole manna. I made that up if you didn't realize. 
But they complained to Moses. And they said, oh, Moses, why did you bring us out into the wilderness where we have no food? Why don't you leave us back in Egypt where we sat by pots of meat? Pots of meat is a Hebrew word from lasagna. My Hebrew professor is rolling over in his grave right now. Why don't you leave us? Don't you love people? What do they do back in Egypt? They complain, God, get us out of here. They get, God gets them out and Moses leaves them out. Oh, if we were just back in Egypt, we just had pots of meat. And Moses says, you know what? When you get into the promised land, you're going to have all the foods you could want, all the foods you could eat, all kinds of food, much better place. And then in the end of verse 9, he says, you're going to have better minerals there. He says, whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper. Stones of iron, they could make weapons out of iron and tools out of iron. And they could dig copper out of the hills. That meant they could be prosperous. And Moses is saying, in the promised land, you'll have all the water, food, minerals, everything you could want. And we would say, man, that sounds like a great life. And what's going to be a great life? Well, what's the problem? There were dangers in that promised land. The same three dangers that you and I face as we enter 2019. Number one, in your outline, there's a danger of being sidetracked. There's a danger of being sidetracked. Look at verse 10. Moses says, when you have eaten and are satisfied. The word satisfied there means when you are full and you have all that you could want. Notice what he says, verse 11, beware. It's a word that means be careful. Be on guard because there's a danger. What's that danger? That you do not forget the Lord your God. Moses says, you know what? When you get into the promised land and you got all the food and all the water and all the minerals and everything that you need, there's a danger there that you'll be satisfied and you'll forget the Lord your God. The word forget there does not mean that they would no longer think about him or, or believe that he exists. I think it's a word that means that, that they would get sidetracked and they would focus on other things and not focus upon God. In other words, Moses is saying to the Israelites, don't make the enjoyment of the land and the food and the water and the minerals and all that you'll have there to enjoy. Don't make that the focus of your life and not God. Now, Moses did not say, don't enjoy the land. He didn't say that. He said, don't, just don't let the focus or the enjoyment of life be your focus. Now, is that a danger for us? Oh, I think so. God has blessed us greatly in our lives. And the danger in 2019 is that you and I will focus so much upon what God has blessed us with, the people and the things, and we'll forget about God. We'll push him to the side. Or we'll become so focused on the responsibilities and the pressures and the demands of everything in our life that we'll focus on them and not God. Right after communism fell in Russia, I was there not long after it fell. We had a tie, our, my church in Ohio that I pastored, we had a tie with a church in Russia there, and so I went to visit them for the first time. And during communism, they did not have the freedom to worship God as much as they wanted to. And so once communism fell, then the people were searching for God. They wanted Bibles. They wanted to be in church, and they wanted to hear the Word of God preached, especially they, they would flock to hear Americans preach. And on that first Sunday when I spoke, I remember there were people everywhere. They heard this American was coming to preach. The sanctuary was filled. I had people beside me just like this. I had people behind me. You know how I like to walk? I couldn't move. There was people everywhere. They even had the doors out into the hallway open, and people were sitting in the hallway. And at times they would open the windows outside so people could stand outside and hear the Word of God preached. And I was amazed. And I remember saying to the pastor, Pastor Demetri, I said, Freedom's got to be great. And I'll never forget. He said to me, it is great. But I fear that as our people enjoy the things that freedom brings, that their hearts will be pulled away from God. And I went back two years later, and that's exactly what had happened. In the lives of many of the people, their hearts were pulled away from God, and they no longer sought God. They no longer came to church. They no longer sought the things of God. Friends, enjoy 2019 and all that God blessed you with. But be careful that you don't get sidetracked and your focus come upon the things of life and not the God of life. Danger number two as they entered the promised land, and the second danger for you and I is the danger of self-assertion. 
that is upon our will. Look at verses 12 and 14 through 14 with me. It says, otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and you have built good houses and you have lived in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In verse 12, Moses uses that word satisfied again, and once again, it is a Hebrew word that means to have all that you want. But then Moses goes on in verse 12, he says, and when you are satisfied, and when you have built good houses, and you live in them, when your houses are great, and when your herds, verse 13, and your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold multiply, and all that you have multiplies. In other words, when life is going well, here's the danger, verse 14, be careful that your heart then will not become proud, and you'll forget the Lord your God. The word proud there is a word that means to be arrogant. It's a word that speaks of self, I believe. And he says, be careful when you, your flocks multiply and you build good houses and your gold and silver multiplies and you have everything you want. Be careful that you do not forget God. Once again, it does not mean that you forget about God. It just means that the focus becomes upon yourself. In other words, the danger of the good life in the promised land for the people of Israel is that when they got there, that life did not become about them and their plans and their wants and their desires and not the very will of God. And yet that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. When they got into the promised land and they enjoyed all that the promised land had, their focus became upon them and their will and their desires and their dreams, and the will of God got pushed to the side. And I would tell you this morning that that is the danger for you and for me in 2019. And you may say, wait a minute, Pastor Larry. We're different than them. We are born-again believers. We attend community Bible church. You don't have to worry about us with that. Understand something. When the Israelites entered into the promised land, they still worshiped God. They still offered their sacrifice. They still served God. They did all the right things. And yet this focus upon self and their will creeped in. And the will of God got pushed to the side. So you and I can be doing all the right things in our spiritual lives and attending church and doing everything right. But the focus can become about us and our desires and our plans. And the will of God gets pushed to the side. This is a very real danger for us. And Moses would say, be careful with the danger of self-assertion. There's a third danger here, and that's the danger of self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Look at verses 15 and 16. Verse 15, Moses said, God led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and its scorpions and thirsty ground, and there was no water, and he brought water for you out of the rock of flint. And in the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. What is Moses doing here? He's reminding them of all that God did for them in the wilderness, as if to say, don't forget that God did this. Why? Because in verse 17 he says that you may not say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. Moses says, you know what, I want to remind you of all that God did for you in the wilderness so you don't think, you know what, this is by my hand. And again in verse 18, he, he reminds him again, he says, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as is this day. Moses says, you know what, God even gives you the ability to work and make wealth. It's like he's doing a double reminder here. He's saying to the people of Israel, don't get into the promised land and think somehow everything you have is by your hand. Remember, it's the Lord God who did this and not you. It's a double warning here. And yet in spite of that double warning, when they got into the promised land, they went on to believe that everything was because of them. They became self-sufficient and they trusted in themselves and not God. Now, they would never say that they were self-sufficient. They would never say, you know what, we're trusting in ourselves and not God. They were too good of Hebrews to say that. But look at verse 17. It says, otherwise you may say in your heart. That means it became their mindset, it became their perspective that life was up to them. And they became self-sufficient. And I would tell you that this is a very real danger for us in our lives, that we become self-sufficient, thinking somehow his life is up to us to handle to make it work. Oh, we are too good of Christians, just like the Israelites. We would never say that, but in our heart, it becomes our perspective, it becomes our mindset, it what guides us in life. 
and we begin to trust in ourselves to handle life. We begin to trust in ourselves to bring things about and not God, and we become self-sufficient. And we begin to trust in ourselves, and whatever you trust in becomes your God. So you and I become little gods trying to make life work, trying to make things work out, trying to handle and control life and people. But let me tell you something. You and I were never meant to be little gods. We were never meant to handle life. God was meant to handle it. But we try and handle it, and we wear ourselves out. We wear ourselves out trying to be a god. And one day we just become overwhelmed physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually because we're trying to play God, and we can't do it. I've been there. And you have too. And Moses would say, be careful in 2019 because that's a very real danger for you to become self-sufficient. In fact, all three of these dangers are very real dangers for you and I in 2019. This isn't just about the Israelites. This is about you and me. All three of these dangers are very real dangers in your life and mine in 2019. And did you notice something? About all three dangers, what did all three dangers have in common? What was at the core of all three? Guess. Self. You are exactly right. Self was at the core of all three of the dangers. You see, the greatest danger for the Israelites as they are in the promised land was not the Hittites or the Amorites or anything else. The greatest danger was themselves. Them. They're not alone because Moses, if you study the life of Moses, the greatest danger in Moses' life was him. And Moses is not alone because the greatest danger in, in if you look at Paul, the greatest danger in Paul's life was himself. In Romans chapter 7, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. He's struggling with himself. Self was at the core of his life. That was his struggle. But Paul's not alone. I recently celebrated my 45th birthday as a believer in Christ. 45 years ago, I trusted in Christ. And 45 years ago, when I trusted in Christ my Savior, I received His forgiveness. I was brought into the family. God had eternal life with God. But do you know what my struggle was? Take a guess. Self. And then a few years after my salvation, I went to seminary. I went to Grace Seminary in Indiana. And Grace was considered by many people to be the top seminary in the country. Some considered another school to be a top. Some considered Grace. I'm not bragging. I'm going to make a point, so stay with me. But Grace was considered by many people to be the top seminary in the country. They were known for their language of the Hebrew and the Greek and the theology. And they were hard. And I got A's in seminary in Hebrew and Greek and theology. I knew my Greek and my Hebrew and my theology. But you know what I struggled with in seminary? Self. And now years later, 45 years after coming to Christ, the greatest struggle in my life, the greatest issue that God wants to change is self in me. But don't look so smugly this morning because your issue is the same thing. The greatest issue in your life this year is self. It's not living in this world. It's not Satan. It's none of the things that will come up in life. The greatest issue in your life is not theology. It's not a lack of commitments. It's not a lack of serving and attending the church. The greatest issue in your life this, this year, the greatest danger is self. I have this saying. I think it was by a Puritan. I, I, I don't know. But listen to what he wrote. He said, the chief thing that has struck me today is how much I still have my hand in the running of my own life. I only say I trust you. I really trust myself. God, when you would guide me, I control myself. When you would be sovereign, I rule myself. When you would take care of me, I take care of myself. When I should depend on your providings, I supply myself. When I should submit to your providence, I follow my own will. When I should study and love and honor and trust you, I serve myself. I fault and correct your laws to suit myself. Instead of you, I look to man's approval. And I am by nature an idolater. And Lord, it is my chief design to bring my heart back to you. Convince me, God, that I cannot be my own God or make myself happy, nor be my own Christ to restore my joy, nor be my own spirit to teach God and rule me, and then God, take me to the cross and leave me there. Do you know what he's saying? God, get rid of the self inside of me. 
I placed this saying on, I have a little filing cabinet as I leave my office, and I've got my picture of the Sea of Galilee. It's my favorite part of Israel there. And, and I've got three sayings. I just added this one. So every time I walk past on the way out, I can just see that piece of paper, and it's a reminder to me. Larry, watch self. You say, so what do we do with self? I think... What we have to do is make a declaration today that life is not about you and me. It's not about us. It's about God. I, I think we need to make a declaration that 2019 will not be about you and me, but it will be about God. And then every morning when we get up, we need to make that declaration again. Today, it's not about me. It's about God. It's not about me. It's about God. Say that with me. It's not about me. It's about God. I think that's the only way to begin to stop it. But then I don't think that's enough because I think number three on your outline, you also have to remember your God in order to stop that or handle self. You have to remember your God. Look at verse 19 with me. This will come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you today that you will surely perish. The word perish there at the end is a Hebrew word. It obviously means to die. But what's interesting about this word perish is that it means to lose. To lose what? What were they going to lose? The promised land and the good life that God offered to them. What would cause them to lose the good life? What was it there that, that what they would do that was going to cause them to, forget or to forfeit what God had offered to them? What was it? It says there. What was going to cause them to forfeit the good life? To go what? To do what? Forget God and do what? And go after other gods. Now, once again, that word forget, I don't think it means to forget about God or that he exists. I think what Moses was saying here was that they were going to allow self and other gods, including the God of self, to become, and people and other things, to become so important to them that God would just become a part of their life. And not life itself. You understand what they were doing. It's not that they were going to focus on or think that God doesn't exist. It wasn't that. It's that they were going to make a God of self and go after these other gods and all these and focus so much upon other people and other things that God became just part of life and not life itself. And when God becomes just part of your life and not life itself, then God will not give you the good life that he offers in 2019. Do we understand that? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor Larry, that's never going to happen to us. I mean, in fact, we are in church right now today. We are studying the Word of God. We are singing praises to God. We are worshiping God. We would never be like the Israelites. Let me share two things with you. First of all, in a couple of weeks from this coming Wednesday, I'm going to start a series on Wednesday nights on the Ten Commandments. We finished today, but now we're going to start the Ten Commandments. It's a challenging series. And I encourage you to come. But what does the first commandment say? You shall have no other what? God's before me. And you know what we're going to find on that Wednesday night when we look at the first commandment? Every one of us has a God in our lives. Every one of us has the God of self there. And we have other gods that we trust in and we look to for approval and for life. We are like them. But you know what else? When the Israelites went into the promised land, they still worshiped God. I told you that before. They still sacrificed their sacrifice to God. They still served God. They sang praises to God. They were doing all the right things. But God became part of their lives and not their lives. And they're not alone. Because you go to Revelation chapter 2 in the church in Ephesus and you will not find a finer church. They had all the right theology, all the right services, all the right programs. They were doing everything right, but they lost their first love, meaning God was just a part of their life. He wasn't their life. And you and I in 2019, we can do all the right things. We can be in church for every service. We can carry the right Bible. We can serve. We can give. We can have all the right commitments. And yet God be, will become just a part of our lives and not our life itself. And that self will win out. You say, so what do we do? 
I would tell you, it's on your outline here, you do two things. Number one, you love God with all your being. And number two, you live for God with all your being. You love God with all your being. And you live for God with all your being. It's that simple. Well, let me ask you a question. What does it mean to love God with all of our being? And when I ask that, right away in our minds, we start thinking of things we have to do, uh, things that we have to do, we have to accomplish. I remember years ago seeing a bumper sticker that said, if you, love, if you love Jesus, honk your horn. Remember that one? Somehow if you honk your horn, you're loving Jesus. And that's corny and that's old and foolish. But it makes a point. See, when we think of loving God, we think of a checklist. I have to check this off. I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do that. And that's not what it means to love God. The Israelites had their checklist. They had it all checked off. Then what does it mean to love God with all of our being? It simply means that no one and nothing will be more important than Him. No one and nothing in life will be more important than God. It's the same thing in John chapter 21. Jesus came to Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? The word these there in the, new, in the Greek, it's, it's hard to tell whether it's masculine or neuter. He says, do you love me more than these? If it's masculine, it means do you love me more than these disciples? And Peter longed for their approval. Peter, do you love me more than these people or any other people? If the word these is neuter there, it means things. It's referring to the Peter's fishing boat and to the great catch of fish they had, which represented financial security. It represented success in life. To Peter, it meant he had value and worth. And Christ says, Peter, do you love me more than all of these? So that's what it means for you and I. In 2019, we will make a commitment to love God more than anyone or anything else. And when you make that commitment, then you'll live for Him with all of your being. I struggled how to make this clear. It's in my mind. I don't know if it's coming out. But I would tell you this. As we enter 2019, I don't think we need to make any more New Year's resolutions. I don't think we need to read any more self-help books. Nothing wrong with them. Nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions. I don't think we need to make more commitments. Except that I think we need to make the commitment this year afresh on this day to love God with all of our being this year. And if we can do that, then everything else will fall into place. So will you make that commitment with me in a few moments? But before we do that commitment, there's one other thing we need to talk about. And that is that maybe you're here and you've never by faith put your trust in Christ as your Savior. You come into this church on this January 2019 and maybe you're coming looking for hope, looking for direction for life, maybe how to have a great year in 2019. But I want to tell you, you can make a decision today that will change your life in 2019 but also change you for all of eternity. You see, the Bible is clear that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're separated from God because of sin. It says we face an eternity in an awful place the Bible calls hell. That's all of us. But the good news is that Christ died with your sins in mind upon the cross, paying the penalty for your sins in mind, and he offers to you this morning forgiveness of your sins and eternal life if you will trust in Christ as your Savior. You can trust in Christ today as your Savior. It'll change your life. It'll change you for eternity. The choice is yours. Just as the choice was the Israelites. They had a choice. They could enjoy the life that God had for them or they could choose not to. You and I have a choice in 2019. We can enjoy the life God has for us or choose not to. Which will you choose? Let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Maybe you're here today. And you've never by faith put your trust in Christ as your Savior. You say, Pastor Larry, I, I don't know if I would die today that I would go to heaven. I'm not sure of that. You can be 100% certain today if you'll bow and trust in Christ as your Savior. He paid for your sins, and you can receive his forgiveness by faith, the Bible says. And one way of expressing your faith is prayer. 
And so if you desire to trust in Christ as your Savior today for the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life with God, then I'm going to ask you silently to pray right where you're sitting and pray these words after me in your heart if, that, if they express the belief in your heart. And pray and say, Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And I thank you for dying with my sins upon that cross. And right now, I trust in you as my Savior and Lord for the forgiveness of my sins. Come and live in my heart. And the Bible says if you're sincere in that prayer, then right now your sins are forgiven. And right now you have eternal life with God. But how about for all of us this morning? You can choose to have a great year in 2019 or to struggle through this year. The dangers are there. And God would say, stop and remember what I've tried to teach you. and Stop and seek what I want to do in your life this year. But it has to start with a fresh commitment, I believe, to love God with all of our being. So I wonder if you would, with your heads bowed, pray with me two things. Just sign it right where you're sitting. And just say, Lord, I make a fresh commitment to love you with all my being this year. And say, God, change me, would you? So I might live the life you desire me to live in 2019. Our Father and our God, I'm grateful today for eternity, and I look forward to when Christ comes back and I rise to meet you in the air. But Father, I'm grateful for the new year you've given to every one of us. I pray afresh that I would love you with all my being this year and I would live for you with all my being. And then, God, I ask you to come and to change my heart and my life this year so I might live a life that's honoring and pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand, please? And maybe you're here today, you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior today in recent days, but you've never made it public. We believe the Bible teaches that we are to make it public when we trust in Christ as our Savior. And one way you can make it public is by coming forward as we sing. Coming forward doesn't save you your sins. But if you've never made public your faith in Christ, then you come as we sing and we'll pray with you and talk to you. Or maybe you're here today and you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, but you've never been baptized since you trusted in Christ. We believe baptism comes after our salvation. That baptism is an outward sign, a declaration of what's happened to inwardly in us in our salvation. Have you tr have been baptized since you trusted in Christ? If not, then you come and we'll set up your baptism. Or maybe you're here today and you say, I'd like to be a part of Community Bible Church, a member here who helped serve in 2019. Then you come as we sing, but come as we sing, please. Together, take my life, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Pastor Matt, begin the new year. Take my life and let it be. Thank you for that. Please be seated. I said a little while ago, it's not about us, it's about God. And that's true for life, but it's also true for salvation. The Bible says there's nothing good in us that made God give to us forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. But out of his amazing love, he died on that cross with your sins in mind, paying the penalty for your sins in mind so we could have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Without that, friends, we had no hope. 
fact, in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, we were hopeless. No ground to stand upon. Even today, you and I have no ground to stand upon except for Jesus Christ. Amen? And this bread is a reminder of that. Simply a slice of bread or cracker, but it's a reminder our hope is in the death of Jesus Christ, that while we were yet hopeless, Christ died upon that cross with your sins and mine. I'm going to ask the men to come now with the bread, and as they come, take a piece, and just bow for a moment, and just give God thanks that while you were hopeless, anything, without anything you could do, that Christ died with your sins upon that cross. table is a very clear reminder it's not about us it's about Christ and his death alone pray with me would you thanks for loving us that much Lord that while we were hopeless helpless nothing we could do you died with our sins upon the cross and the judgment and the wrath for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And now on this first Sunday in January, we celebrate that. And we do so in Christ's name. Amen. Please. And then that's followed with the cup. Simply a cup of juice. It's a very clear reminder that when Christ died with our sins, he paid the penalty, the price for all of our sins. So when God looks at us now, he looks at us through the blood of Christ. He says, they're clean, they're beautiful in my sight. See, we see our sins, we see our failures, we see our struggles, but God looks at us through Christ. And that's what the Lord's table is. It's a reminder, not just that he died with our sins, it's a reminder when God looks at me now, it's all forgiven. All because of the blood of Christ. So as the cup is passed, if you'll take a cup and then just bow and just thank him for that. And think about what it means to be clean and beautiful in his sight. Gentlemen.
remember 45 years ago when I trusted in Christ, the wonder of it all, that he would die for me and he would save me. Now, 45 years later, I look back and I wonder what an amazing God we have, that he would love us and die for us. Let's pray and thank him. It's hard to comprehend, God. There's nothing good in us. No reason that took you to that cross. And yet you did it to save us of our sins by your mercy and your grace. And now on this first Sunday in January, we just want to stop and say thank you. Right, everyone? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come as we receive the morning offering. <coughs> if you're a guest here for the first time, please, you don't need to put anything in the offering bag. Just take that Connect card and fill it out and place it in the bag as it comes by, and we'd love to send you some information about Community Bible Church. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks. Thanks for your faithfulness, your goodness, your blessing to us in 2018 and even for this week. And now we have the amazing privilege of worshiping and giving back to you part of what you've given to us. And we do so in Christ. Amen. Upward Sports is an amazing ministry that reaches our community with the gospel of Christ through sports. We are expecting around 325 athletes to participate in our soccer league this 2019 season. It is very exciting to see how the Lord has grown this ministry. And each year we are seeing more families come to know him because of volunteers like you. We are in need of 150 volunteers to make this upcoming soccer season run smoothly. The season runs February 16th through May 21st. Here are the areas we need your help in. 30 head coaches, 30 assistant coaches, referees, prayer partners, greeters, evaluation and orientation volunteers, concessions, setup and cleanup crews. Volunteers really are the backbone of our Upward Sports League as they successfully carry out the Upward Sports mission, promoting the discovery of Jesus through sports. The insert in your bulletin outlines in more detail the many opportunities available to serve. Please complete and place in the offering bag or visit us in the atrium. We are excited that you will consider becoming one of our volunteers, proudly putting the gospel on display so that others can see Christ in you and build a lifelong relationship with him. Thank you.